Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard that it was said of those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus, you call us to a way that is holy, to lives that are consecrated to you and to your purpose and to your mission. Grant that we may indeed, by your Holy Spirit's power, live into this calling and know the joy of our lives lived in the light. Amen. Paul writes in his letter to the church at Corinth, we are God's servants working together. You are God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Paul, in his letter, is striving to build the church as a wise master builder. But it has not been easy. Because the church at Corinth, who he has written this letter to, is confused about the basic understanding of the way that God works. Paul writes then, Do not deceive yourselves. If you think you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. The wisdom of the day in Corinth was a worldly wisdom. And this had tainted the faith community and torn at the fabric of their life together. The worldly wisdom, maybe not so different from our time, valued and honored those with wealth, education, social standing, the powerful, and the sophisticated. This created a foundational value system that was elitist and divisive, elevating some people, humbling, shaming, and excluding others. Paul argued The wisdom of God is revealed in the cross of Christ. Self-giving love is God's way. Christ's sacrifice for the world. People shaped by this self-giving love will show love toward one another, especially those who have been dishonored or those who have special need. I remember one of my early lessons in this Christ-centered love. It was summer. I was in high school working for Albert Berg on his dairy farm. We were riding in his old GMC pickup truck, pulling a hay wagon, going from one field to another. When we came to an intersection and Albert slowed down to make the turn at the corner and he casually pointed to a field of corn 
I'm sure it was at least 40 acres. And he said, that corn is for hunger relief. Now, Albert was a big farmer, a successful farmer. But this is how his status was working itself out. Albert was an active member of my home church. I checked with my dad, his pastor, about this field of corn. And sure enough, all the income from the sale of that corn, Albert gave to the hunger program. Christ's love for Albert was his foundation. And his generosity and self-giving grew out of that foundation. He could have maybe bought a new pickup truck, used the field to help pay for it, further elevating himself. It was as if he was affirming Paul's decision. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the wisdom of God found in the cross of Christ. As Paul wrote earlier in his letter, the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God chose what the world looks down on and despises and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is important. God has made Christ to be our wisdom. A pastor colleague who I'll never forget, who I learned a lot from, told the story of his mother who when she was diagnosed with cancer was told by the oncologist she would be able to try a treatment program that would not extend or prolong her life and she responded I'm not doing that I'm going home to live the best I can the doctor gave her three or six months she lived 16 months and when she died she was 80 pounds as the end of her life was coming Her pastor's son would visit her regularly, walk into her bedroom. Her sleep was intermittent, aided by medications. Sometimes he would just sit beside her bed and watch her breathe and think about life and the gift his mother had been. When she woke up after they visited, she would always ask him to read scripture and pray. Every visit, she always asked for Psalm 23. One day he asked her, Mom, how come you always ask me to read the 23rd Psalm? And she looked at him and said, When you kids were young and I didn't know how I was going to feed you, the Lord was all I had. And he was enough. She belonged to Christ. The foundation of her life was Jesus Christ. Aren't we fortunate when we come to that place in life where Christ is our all in all? Sometimes along the way we get distracted by other messages, bringing false hope, just like the people in Corinth, messages to which they had become addicted. We can translate some of them directly, maybe to our own day too. You'll be better if you can make yourself look better. Move up and don't give a thought to the people behind you. You'll be more complete and admired if you own it. Spend time and pay attention to people who will help you get ahead. 
St. Paul invites his readers at the church at Corinth to surrender all these soul-eroding anxieties and addictions and see that the true foundation of life is Christ. Paul writes, Like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has already been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. During the Epiphany season, we have been considering what it means to belong to Jesus and to live in the light of Christ, to be that light to others. Considering questions like, how am I using my time and talent? How am I being generous with what God has blessed me? How am I putting love for neighbor into action? The Holy Spirit stirs us with these questions. In what ways are we building our lives on Jesus, Christ crucified? My pastor colleague who told me about his mother who read the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, as she was dying, told also about younger days when he was a boy and his father died. He died unexpectedly, suddenly. And after he died, his mom was left with three young children. When she went to work following his death, she was able to get a job as a secretary. She had two goals. The first goal was to continue what she and her husband had been doing, and that was giving a tithe to the church, giving to God. And she did that. The second goal was to get her kids a college education. She did that. We were poor, my pastor colleague remembers, and we were very rich. Mom was a giver, and givers are rich. She belonged to Christ. She had built her life on Christ. Her trust, her security was found in Jesus. The Spirit stirs us. What foundation am I building my life on today? What foundation are you building your life on today? I read some challenging words recently from Peter Marty. A good life imbued with virtue and light is one shaped by intentional acts that are too precious to leave to haphazard behavior. Virtues don't just magically appear in us the day someone cuts the umbilical cord. We learn generosity and we learn love over time as virtues are transformed into personal disciplines that become habits. Virtues transformed into personal disciplines that become habits. What are some ways you want to change? I invite you to prayerfully challenge yourself to build on Christ even more deeply than you already have. The blue card is a tool as Valerie was talking about, the generosity team has provided this tool for that purpose, to use for your own personal reflection this week. What new choices, intentional choices, will help you build on the foundation of Christ? For example, in prayer and worship, you might say, I want to be more 
grateful in my prayer life. Or in time and talent, I want to think about this one person who needs my help or attention at this time in their life. Or maybe it is a group or an organization that you have gifts or talents for that also helps people that you want to commit yourself to. And in the area of financial giving, maybe it is a plan for giving based on what God has given you, whether it's a tithe of 10% or whatever proportion it is, recognizing that God has given you everything you have and everything you are and that your life will be full as you respond to God and give to God. The blue card is for you to keep. It is between you and God. And next week at worship, you can leave the blue card at home, but come to worship. And in your mind, I invite you to have a personal plan that you want to dedicate to God. We're not going to ask you to write anything down next Sunday. But we will have a rededication of ourselves, our lives, to God as an act of worship, an epiphany, light shine, rededication, building on Christ. And so let us prepare our hearts to demonstrate with our lives, that the Lord is enough, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Thanks be to God.